Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's like a real small city. It's about an hour, 10, 15 minutes away from here. But it's like one of those cities where you can walk from one side to the other in about 10 minutes. So I grew up, I grew up in York, Pennsylvania. I graduated high school back in 2013. So I'm not that old. Uh, I know you, uh, sometimes people come to see y'all, you probably think you're old, but I graduated in 2013 with a basketball scholarship and went to Millersville University. And I ended up losing my scholarship two short years in Millersville due to bad grades. Right, what happened was the coach basically said the three or four people with the lowest grades, they kicked off the team and helped raise the team's GPA because the basketball team had the lowest GPA in the, in the whole school. Go figure. So what, what ended up happening was I came back to New York and I, what I call fall victim to my environment, but the reality was I started hanging out with people that never went to college, never had big dreams, goals, or ambitions, and I ended up starting selling drugs, running around in the streets, and what comes with that is jail. Right, so shortly after, uh, my illegal entrepreneur endeavors, I found myself incarcerated. And I'll never forget because I'm so thankful for my, my wife, obviously you guys see she's here today, but she's also my high school sweetheart. And the day I got arrested, she was sitting right there as they put handcuffs on me and put me in the back of the police car. And I seen her crying, and that's kind of what started shifting my paradigm and shifted my perspective. And I realized that this thing called life is a lot bigger than just us. Right, the decisions that we make affect other people, affect other people's lives. And at the time, we had a two-year-old daughter, and I got arrested a week after my two-year-old daughter's second birthday. So I'm glad she was still young enough, but she doesn't remember a lot of that stuff, but that stuff still really struck me and hit me. So when I was sitting in jail, I started thinking, I started realizing, like, I like making money, but the illegal part I really don't like because jail wasn't something that I wanted to do. So after I was sitting in jail for 14 months, that's when I had a paradigm shift and I realized that if I wanted to make an impact, if I wanted to make money, I had to figure out a legal way to do it. And unbeknownst to a lot of people, I started my lawn care business when I was 14 years old. So people were always ask me, when I lost my scholarship, why didn't I just start the lawn care business back up? Why didn't I go to transfer to a different school? And the reality was a lot of times we're not prepared for when tragedy happens or adversity happens or opposition hits us. So I didn't know exactly how to handle that. And I don't know where you guys all come from or where you're at in life, but one thing I did learn is that opposition and tragedy and adversity is gonna hit everybody at some point. Right, whether it's getting an F on your first paper or failing a class entirely or getting kicked out of college or losing a boyfriend or losing a girlfriend, at some point we all face something in our lives and how we kind of rebound from that is actually what defines and dictates our character. So when I got out of jail, I said, okay, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna try this long game business again. But before I tried it, my wife kept telling me I needed to get a job, I needed to get a job. So I was trying to get a job, and I went to this first factory job, and then they brought mine, I actually started cleaning windows for a guy, and they told me that we get 30% and the company gets 70%. So we went and did this big job, and I remember, because it was like a $1,300 job, and after the job, my check was like $200, and I started doing the math. I know I don't know if any math majors are in here, but 200 is 30% of 1,300, right? So I started thinking to myself, I said, okay, so I think I'm getting ripped off. So I went to a, another factory job, and the factory job I went to, we was building kitchen cabinets, and I liked it for a little bit, and then I was talking, I was supposed to get a raise after six months, and I went to the guy and said, hey, what about that raise? And he said, oh, you gotta talk to the owner, which confused me because the owner wasn't the guy that hired me, it was the manager that hired me and promised me the raise. So then I was talking to this lady, and she said that she's been working at this job for 20 years, and she never got a raise. So I, I told her I'm not gonna put 20 years in here, so I ended up quitting that job. Then I went to another factory and they had me painting, painting metal pieces. You know, when they build these big buildings, there's like metal, a lot of metal that goes on the inside. So I was painting these metal pieces so they wouldn't rust up while they're sitting outside. And the, the owner of that company, he hired his best friend to do a welding job and his best friend didn't know how to do the job. Then I noticed some days when it would be nice outside, he'll leave in the middle of the day to go home to get his motorcycle and come back to work. So I just started realizing that it wasn't really fair. Right, I know fair is a place that they sell funnel cakes and judge pigs, but I just didn't think that it was something that I wanted to do. So that's when I, re I relaunched my lawn care business and the whole goal was to make it equitable. So I provide jobs to a lot, of, a lot of kids. I provide jobs to a lot of people that were formerly incarcerated just to get them another opportunity to make some income. Because the reality is a lot of people in this world don't like to work and don't have any money. The two don't really go together for me, but I mean, whatever floats your boat, right? So what I learned is, Two short years after I was released from prison, I was released from prison on April 30th of 2017. Two short years, I'm sorry, 2018. Two years after that, February 22nd, 2020, my brother was shot and killed. And when my brother was shot and killed, that's when I realized that money is not everything. I had to find my purpose in this world. And that's when I started the nonprofit called the Advantage Program. 
The Advantage Program is a, a program where we help the youth in the city and we try to expose them to life. Right, because a lot of times, especially in my city, a lot of people never cross the bridge, a lot of people never leave the city, and if all you ever do is sit in this place that you've always been, the reality is you're not gonna know anything else other than the block you grew up on or the city that you grew up in. So I say, I say that to say, I just wanted to provide a little bit of background about myself because I'm very passionate about helping people not fall victim to the judicial system. I'm very passionate about the, uh, the people that are in the judicial system and that are impacting a lot of society because the reality is the United States leads the world in incarceration. And in the 90s, there was this bill passed for mass incarceration, and people say that it targeted black people, but in my opinion, it targeted people that was committing crimes, because if you got caught with drugs, obviously you're gonna go to jail. Right, there's some things that lead to jail, but being inside of the jail system, what I realized is a lot of people are in there for selling drugs or using drugs. So a lot of times, the, the incarceration revolves around drugs. Obviously, that's not everything, but I met a guy that was in there for burglary, but he was burglarizing somebody's house to get money to buy drugs. I met people that were in there that sold drugs, that used drugs, that, I don't know, they call themselves pharmaceutical uh, engineers, but they're drug dealers, right? So what I, what I quickly realized is that there's a lot of things that impact people's paradigm. There's a lot of reasons why people end up in prison, but the flip side of that is the people that get to make the decisions or I have a very huge responsibility to play in it as well. Because now I have a few friends that are judges at the magistrate level as well as the upper court. Uh, um, I'm friends with the district attorney. He's actually running for attorney general uh, this coming election. I'm friends with the police commissioner as well as some police officers. And none of them ever say that they're out to put people in jail. But the reality is if people weren't committing crimes, they wouldn't have a job. Right, so it's like an oxymoron. They have to be doing something. But a lot of you guys, especially uh, with, with criminology, you guys, are, is anybody a criminology major? So we have a couple. So you guys are gonna be part of the solution. Right? And what I've learned is that this is a big, a big topic, especially around the world, because a lot of times people don't realize exactly what's factored into being a part of the solution. Um, so I, I gave you guys some background on myself, as well as uh, the nonprofit that I founded in my lawn care business. I also go to high schools. I have a, a workbook here. Uh, what I did was after I was released from prison, I created, I wrote a book, and from that book, I created this um, this workbook. And what this workbook is, is it's a, it's a six-week course that I go to school to facilitate. Oh, you can have some right here. They can take a look at it. It's a, it's a, a six-week workbook that I facilitate at different schools throughout the state, well, actually throughout the country. And the, the goal of the workbook is to help people realize their own power, their own life, to help them control their own narrative. Because a lot of times, like I said, you fall victim to your environment. There's certain risk factors that we'll talk about shortly, but the goal of this workbook is to help people realize their own power. So I go to schools, I motivate them, I inspire them, but the real, like, the real truth is I try to give them their power back. So I was watching this movie, it's called The Hate That You Give. And the movie's about a young black girl who goes to school in a white suburban area. She lives in a black, in a black uh, rural city and goes to school in a white suburban area. So she's basically living two different lives. And one thing she had to learn how to do was code switch. When she goes to school, she's a completely different person than she is when she's at home, when she's with her friends, or when she's with her family. But what I realized is that there's this thing called compre con preconceived notions and this thing called biases. So in a second, I want to ask you what a preconceived notion is, but biases I've learned are here to protect us, right? Everybody has biases. Everybody thinks different things as soon as you see somebody. And most of our biases are formed based off of our experiences in life. So some preconceived notions that were in the movie where they were saying that uh, she's probably going to be eating fried chicken and she's faster than everybody because she's black. And she had some preconceived notions about some of her white counterparts as well. But what I realized is these preconceived notions and these biases affect our judgment. And I don't want to ask you guys preconceived notions. I'm not one of those guys that get easily offended, but I know how it is to be a college kid. You guys, you guys don't really like to talk, so I have an activity to help you guys get talking in a second. <laughs> But what I realized in this movie very quickly was the truth of the matter is these preconceived notions and these biases ended up getting a young black man shot and killed because he they was on a date and the black man was reaching in the car to get his brush and the police a white police officer thought he was going for a gun and the police officer shot him. And he ran up and said, where's the gun, where's the gun? And the girl said, what are you talking about? And she said, he, she grabbed his brush and he said, there's no gun. And all of a sudden there was a war going on between two different communities all because of a preconceived notion. 
Right? See, sometimes we end up judging somebody before we get to know them. And Martin Luther King said, judge a person by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And obviously, everybody in here is from a different background, different ethnicity, and whatnot, different environments. But what I learned is, as judges sitting up, making a ruling on somebody that has a case coming in front of them, all the judge has to go off of is a piece of paper without knowing the person. Right? When a police officer goes to arrest somebody and they pull somebody over, all they have to go off of is the prior training. And if the trainer says, if four black people are in a car and they're more likely to be doing something, he walks up and smells marijuana, he has a reason to pull them over. Right? See, a lot of times we don't realize the role that preconceived notions and biases play even in our day-to-day -day life. But I'm pretty sure when you guys are walking on the college campus, if you see somebody that you don't know, your mind automatically forms an opinion of them before you get to know them. So there's this thing called the school to prison pipeline, and what I started realizing is there's a lot of correlations between school and prison. See right here it says that there's a zero tolerance discipline result in black students facing a disproportionately harsher punishment than their white students in public school. Now I don't want to make this a black and white thing, but the statistics and numbers don't lie. Right, when you look at it, that public schools enroll more white students than black students, but somehow more black students than white students get suspended. Then they started incorporating what they call school safety officers or school resource officers. And the school I went to, there's metal detectors and the resource officers walk around with guns. See, a lot of times this, this thing is injustice, but this is in certain schools. Because again, I go to a lot of different schools and every school doesn't have metal detectors. Every school doesn't have an armed resource officer. But when you're in this environment, there's a saying that if you treat people like monkeys, they're gonna behave like you're in a zoo. And when you think about the school to prison pipeline, a lot of times when a student gets in trouble, they get suspended or get in school suspension, which continues the downward spiral. The school system is supposed to be there to help them, to educate them, to inform them. So one thing I learned being in prison, and this is being in prison, that's my, uh, my lovely wife here. She, like I said, she's my high school sweetheart. That's my two-year-old daughter, and both my uh, stepdad, my mom, as well as my dad. But the, uh, down here in the corner picture is the picture that I want you guys to focus on, because a lot of times what we don't realize is the reality of being incarcerated. See, there's this thing called the recidivism rate, and a lot of times when people come out of prison, they end up going back to prison. In fact, in Pennsylvania, 67% of people that are released from prison end up back in prison. And my question to you guys would be why? And that's a rhetorical question, but the reality is, if the prison is here to rehabilitate offending individuals, why do more than half of them end up back in prison? You see, this guy here is sweeping up and you get paid 19 cents an hour. So when I was incarcerated, I got paid like 23 cents an hour. But I told myself, if I could work for 23 cents an hour, I could probably work for minimum wage. But I had a friend growing up, and my friend, the first time he got arrested was 14 years old. And he told me the first time he ever sold drugs was 12 years old. He was on his way to middle school. And he sees his friend selling drugs, and the drug dealer dropped some crap on the ground. He picked it up, found somebody to sell it to, and he never looked back. And he's now 32 years old, and from 14 to 32 years old, he's never spent more than one year on the streets as a civilian. So he's been in and out of jail, in and out of jail, and he's currently in federal prison. And he asked me, what do I think he should do? And I told him when he gets out, he should probably get a job. And what he said to me, what really struck me and rung my bell, because he said, how? See, when you start, when you jump into this life at a young age, a lot of people don't have any work experience, a lot of people don't have any credit, they don't have a bank account, they don't have a house, they don't have a car. So there's these things that really prevent them from being a successful civilian, especially when you release from prison and you don't have a house, you don't have an ID, you don't have a way to get to and from work. But you have these things called parole and probation officers that mandate certain things, and then they can give you, they can put you back in prison if you don't abide by the rules. So this system is perpetuating a lot of criminal activity and behaviors because instead of helping people accomplish some things, they're actually penalizing people for the things they don't accomplish. And this is more of the school to prison pipeline that I was talking about. Because where you invest your money ultimately is where people go. And when I learned that the average inmate, and this is Pennsylvania specific, but the average inmate is $42,000, but the average student is $15,000, that's a $27,000 gap. And then you look in the juvenile detention center, and this is in New York, but they face a bed crisis, meaning they're running out of places to house these kids. So what they do now is if a kid is caught for gun, they release this kid back to their parents. 
What I learned is by the third grade, if you're not on reading level, they start building a new jail cell, and once they get to, let's say, 100 jail cells, you have a brand new jail. But where the, where the dollars go is where the people flow. But everybody doesn't get the whole picture. Because as, as shown in this picture, there's a lot of different things that pull people in a, in a, different, a lot of different ways. But this picture right here is a picture I often show to people because everybody doesn't get it. Because everybody's always so tough, like my friend I was talking about. Everybody's always so tough. But here you see a 21-year-old, and he gets life on parole for a murder. Oh, sorry, I ain't allowed to cuss. You guys don't cuss, right? <laughs> but what happens is, there's, there's these sentencing guidelines that judges have to go by. So if a person commits a heinous crime, a judge can then maximize their sentence. And a judge threatens you that to me. When I got incarcerated, the judge told me I, got, I was sentenced two to four years, and he told me that he can aggravate my sentence, which means take that back number of four years and make that the front number, and instead of a two to four year sentence, I'll get a 48 sentence or they have the power to mitigate a sentence and they can make your time less than two years. And this is my first time going in front of the judge. So my question was, was there a preconceived notion there? Was there a bias there? Why would he want to aggravate my sentence? When the district attorney and my lawyer came to an agreement on two to four years with triple RI, which, which means uh, they basically take a percentage of your time so you can get out early and then also is granted boot camp. In Pennsylvania, boot camp is a six month program that guarantees your release because when you get incarcerated and go upstate in Pennsylvania, you go before they call the parole board and the parole board doesn't have to necessarily guarantee your release. I have a cousin right now that's incarcerated on a 20 year sentence and he's 14 years in and every time he goes before the parole board, he gets a hit, which is actually called a violation. And you can get a technical violation, but these violations aren't just, you gotta come back and see us in a month. The first time we got a six month violation, the second time we got a two year violation. So you couldn't go back before the parole board for two years for a sentence because the, uh, him and his girlfriend was in a dispute and he shot at her. Now I don't think that was right, but 20 years for shooting at somebody is a bit extreme and then continuous violation, certain now he's currently 14 years in. And he asked me what do I think and I told him I think he should keep trying. So these are, these are some stats that I, that I looked up because again, the school to prison pipeline, I'm sorry to get a little blurry, when you, when you blow stuff up, it, gets, it hits the story a little bit. But this was what I was talking about, the incarceration versus education, and there's 75 billion spent per year on incarceration, compared to 65 billion spent on college. So when you sit and look at some of these numbers, they really blow my mind, because a lot of times we don't realize just how effective the dollars that are funding to the prison system is. But the reality is prison is a big business and if they didn't put any money into it, a lot of people would be out of a job. So what role does environment play in person development? I heard a story one time and the story said, if you take a white kid who both parents go to college, work decent jobs, and that kid ends up going to college, he did exactly what he's supposed to do. But the opposite is true. If you take a black kid who grows up in a poor neighborhood and only sees the people selling drugs and he ends up selling drugs, he did exactly what he was supposed to do. See, the, the environment shapes us and molds us into the individuals that we are today, but a lot of times when you're in the environment, you don't really see it. So one thing I learned is when you go through things, sometimes everybody goes through hard things. And I know 12 and 13 year olds that have seen people dead die. I know 12 and 13 year olds whose parents are fine with them smoking, smoking weed, smoking whatever. I know 14 and 15 year olds whose parents are fine with them drinking. And then the question is, how do some people overcome that and some people don't? It reminds me of a story of uh, two, uh, two identical twins. Does anybody have an uh, identical twin? No, thank God. I did this one time, like four people raised their hands. <laughs> But identical twins, basically same DNA, almost the same person. And they grew up, they said when the mom gave birth to the two twins, the mom ended up dying on the birth bed. I don't know if any of you know, but birth is a very tragic thing. And she ended up dying on the birth bed, and because she died, the dad turned into an alcoholic and started drinking. And one of the kids grew up and said that he never drank a day in his life because his dad was an alcoholic, while the other kid drank every day, and he said because his dad was an alcoholic. Same kid, same DNA, same environment, two different outcomes. So what role does environment actually play in our growth and our development? A 
Oh, so here goes the, the, the next one's the fun part. So this is what I need you guys to do. Uh, there's one, two, three different uh, stairs. I need everybody to start at the top of the stairs. We're gonna work our way down. I'm gonna ask you guys a couple questions. Um, if you answer yes to the question, you can take a step take a step down. If you answer no, just stay where you're at. I don't care what side you go to, we have three different sides. So the first question is, is about family support. If you, if you right now in college have family support or you have people in your family that help hold you accountable, take two steps forward. Good. Growing up, if you witnessed any violence, as in fighting or gun violence, stay where you're at. If you did not, take two steps forward. Before the age of 18, is everybody over 18? Sweet, before the age of 18, if you ever used drugs, alcohol, or had substance abuse problems, stay where you're at. If you did not, take two steps forward. If you've ever been diagnosed with any mental health diagnoses or had to use meds in, in your whole life, stay where you're at if you did not take two steps forward. And that's, uh, so for me, I, I was diagnosed with ADHD, so I'm gonna stay where I'm at. If you've ever been in a fight, take two steps forward. I right, here goes a good one. Do you enjoy school or do you enjoy your homework? If you do, take two steps forward. Homework? Yeah, well, you guys don't get homework? You guys, you guys step up, man. <laughs> Uh, all right, there's two more. How do, how do I phrase this? Uh, if, you, if you have a GPA above a 3.0, take two steps forward. <laughs> and then the last one. Growing up, did any of your friends ever get in trouble, end up in jail, or end up in dead or in prison? Well, in prison jail. End up dead, end up in jail, or end up getting in trouble by the law enforcement. If they did stay where you're at, they did not take two steps up. So this is pretty good because nobody ended up down, down the whole way. Um, you guys go ahead and grab your seats. Thank you for participating. Dr. Jessica's about to hand out a paper called risk factors, but I want you guys to do is take, is take a, a couple of minutes to, to fill this out. Does everybody have something to write with? You guys are on the ball. I'll go to the place where the kids don't have pencils, don't have pen, they like, don't have a pen, they're not in school. So, so this is a yes, a yes or no uh, type of thing. If you don't know the answer, you can leave it blank. You can ask me as well. But what we just did is called risk factors. So there's these things called risk factors, these things called protective factors. Risk factors literally look at the different things the child experiences and it, and it determines how that child will end up. What I've realized is doing this with people that are currently incarcerated on their way home, they never realized that growing up, believe it or not, a kid shouldn't see somebody shot and killed. Growing up, a kid shouldn't see somebody overdose on drugs. Growing up, a kid shouldn't be in an environment where their parents are using drugs, or their parents are drinking, and their parents start beating them because they're drunk. So growing up, there's a lot of things that we experience and we don't realize that those, those things actually heighten our risk factors to not be successful. But there's the opposite of protective factors. Do you have family support? Is there an adult in your life? Do you, have, do you know your kid's friends? So a lot of these things, you can answer as an adult, you can answer as yourself, but what I realized is that the higher the protective factors, the lower the risk factors, the more likely that somebody's gonna be successful. So I, I'll, uh, I'll shut up now and give you guys a couple minutes to go ahead and get this done, and then we'll jump back in.